My name is Julie Pearson Little Thunder. Today is Friday, March 11th, and I'm interviewing Mal Kornshucker as part of the Oklahoma Native Artists Project, sponsored by Oklahoma Oral Histories Research Program at Oklahoma State University. We're at Mal's studio in the Brady Arts District, downtown Tulsa. Mal, you're a potter and ceramic sculptor, a Cherokee tribal member who found his medium at a very early age. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Jay, Oklahoma, uh, 1952, October the 4th. And I was stayed in Oklahoma until I was about four. We moved to Kansas City to Missouri. Missouri for um, my dad to, to get a job, a better job, you know, better paying job. And all us kids went there and we went to school. And so I've been in, went to Kansas City High School, you know, high school, the uh, school uh, district, graduated in 1970, went to Bake Home College for uh, one semester, 1970, the fall of 1970, and after that I went to Southwest Missouri State uh, University, uh, University in Bolivar, Missouri. Okay. Um, you come from a family of artists. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, my uh, grandfather, who was named Lincoln, Lincoln Trotting Wolf, who lived to be 100 years old, had built his own rug uh, loom. And he, built, he made rugs and blankets. And so his, his loom was always on the porch. It was something for me to play on something for me to get in trouble on. <laughs> and so that uh, he was a rug weaver. I've had well, cousins who are basket weavers. Uh, my dad was a silversmith uh, in later years. So art has always been there for me. You know, it's always been there. Um, and you're going through grade school, you uh, have these uh, like in first grade or second grade, you have uh, who can make the best looking uh, Valentine's <laughs> Day box. And, and they were a little contest, not knowing it, but uh, then it, for some reason I'd always win. Or who would make the best looking Easter egg while all the rest of the kids are making theirs into faces, I'm making <laughs> mine into birds, you know, putting wings on them wow. and winning these, these things. So art's always been there and it's always been easy. Well, no. I'm struck ahead. by the fact that they're kind of dimensional, both the box and the Easter egg. Oh yeah, they are. I hadn't <laughs> thought about that, but uh, yeah, they were. So uh, I went on to high school. In high school, I took art. Art was always, like I said, easy there. And and what did you kind of encouragement did you get um, in the public schools with your? Uh, obviously, you got reinforcement at the grade school level because mm -hmm. you were so good. In high school, was it also a positive experience? Oh, uh, yes, I had one one uh, art teacher. His name was Mr. West, and he was always saying, "Well, you know, you can you can do this. You can do this better, and you can always add more to it." And he was talking about my three dimensional pieces. I didn't realize, but he was talking about my three dimensional pieces. I worked in plaster, wet plaster, making uh, figurines, things like that, and. Um, I made a piece of uh, metal sculpture, kind of like a Venus flytrap, kind of coming up like that. And so I've always, you know, it's always been easy, and I never thought about it as a career. Right. Um, you, I read that you did take a um, ceramics class in uh, at Southwest Baptist University. Yes, I, Were you taking other classes there too, or just that particular class? Well, I was going to school, and I uh, was on kind of on track to be a tribal lawyer through the, the Cherokee, um, Cherokee tribe. And I needed to take a studio art course. I went down to Silver Dollar City, saw a potter throwing pots, watched him, was thrilled, real enthralled with watching him do that. Went back to school, I guess in my second or third year of college, Signed up for ceramics, took a course, quit college, went looking for a job as a potter. Right. 
Uh, just to pick up again on the um, tribal lawyer thing, which I thought was interesting. So it was mainly the fact that there was some funding available if right. you followed that course of study. If I made it through my <laughs> bachelor's and had good grades and got accepted into a law school, that they would pay for my law school and I would be a tribal lawyer for them for, I think it was about four or five years, something like that, to okay. pay them back. So aside from the fact that you had already been showing a lot of interest in three-dimensional sculpture and figurines and such, what was it about that ceramics course that really kind of proved a turning point for you? There, and it sounds, you know, it sounds like I'm really making this up, but it's the ease of it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there was a upper level, you know, like he was a, a senior uh, art student there. And he showed me, okay, this is what you do, you know, real basic. <laughs> this is, you know, you center the clay and then you open it up. And he showed me basically one lesson. And then I got in there and started all any available, available time. I was in, my, in the studio messing around with clay. And my pots were ugly and crude. But uh, my mom saved them. I still got them. Okay. So, so, but uh, thick and heavy. But they were up, and you know had walls. Right. So they were actual pots, but they were just heavy, heavier than heck. So. Well, you have an interesting story, I guess, about um, you when you left school. You became an apprentice potter at Silver Dollar City, which is a well-known resort town in Missouri. Mm -hmm. And I understand there were several other people competing for that job. Um, did you have to demonstrate your skills? How did that work? Yes, when I um, I uh, had the, you fill out your application, you have a um, interview with the head potter. So he gets, he says, okay, you know, let's see what you can do. He says, I want you to do this. And he shows me, you know, what he wants. And I come, you know, I come kind of close to it, not as, you know, not as big and not as neat as his, but, you know, I showed him what I could do. And I guess he was impressed enough because I got the job and there was something like eight or nine people wanting the job. Wow. And kind of pissed off a few people because they thought they were going to get the job. So. so how long did you work there and what did you learn that you applied to your art later? Uh, Silver Dollar City was a good place to learn. I mean, I did it every day. I was on the wheel for the three hours a day at least. Wow. Or three hours, you know, sometimes four hours, but I was on the wheel for four hours a day. And it got me over my uh, fear of being in front of people because I had to do demonstrations in front of people. There was easily anywhere from 10 to 50 people and it changed over every 15 minutes. And so I was, you know, uh, doing demonstrations all that time. But it got me to a point where I could throw what I wanted to. I just had to learn how to master more amounts of clay, bigger amounts of clay. But it, and it showed me, it did all the basics. It showed me how to mix glazes, what what's the process is, what's the process of firing, how to fire pieces, uh, everything you need to know as a potter, they taught me. And that was, like I said, it was a great place to learn. Uh, not a great place to hang out for, for any length of time, but it was a great place to learn. I, I enjoyed the time I was there. And I thought, that's time for me to get out. And, you know, <laughs> and jumped out. And um, what did you move on to next? After I um, uh, quit working for the city, I, I took a break and went to Colorado and worked as a, a land surveyor, climbed mountains. So I was in, in the mountains, uh, in and around the Crested Butte for about six months. Beautiful area. Yeah, it was, and I, I enjoyed that all very much. But um, it was one of those things like after about three or four months, I just couldn't wait to get back and to start playing play. And I moved back to Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, I moved in with my folks, they said it was okay, and I set up my studio in their basement. 
and I built my own gas kill outside in their backyard, which they were, they were very, <laughs> very supportive, you know, and uh, so they thought it was great. And that's how I got started and started doing little shows, little local shows, you know, in, in and around Kansas City and not making any money. And for some reason, I, but I made... What I kinds made of things it. were you making at that time? Oh, just very simple cups, uh, simple bowls. And at that time, I hadn't done any um, uh, Indian motifs on my pieces. They were just strictly glaze on glaze, let the glaze do the work. And, but I was getting uh, rather uh, good success with that. So where and when did you meet Michelle? I met Michelle in, in college, and uh, we dated all through the college. She did. We dated all through my uh, work at Silver Dollar City and everything like that. And we kept on dating, and finally, oh, let's let's get married. So <laughs> we got married, and and she was okay with me being a potter. She, you know, she didn't make any demands on me like. You need to get a job. We're, we're getting married, so you need to get a job. We, you need to get a job. She wasn't that way. She was she was all, all for me being a potter and has been supported all the way through my career. That's wonderful. I guess I want to pick up on Bacon a bit because um, then in between, um, when, were you, when were you at Bacon? I graduated in um, 1970 in Kansas City, Missouri, and that fall I was in, in Bacon, in the fall of 1970. Was that um, sort of the time then when you began thinking about incorporating Indian motifs, or you became more exposed to More exposed to it. Arts I mean, I went to high school in Kansas City, it was a Northeast Senior High School, and I was the only Indian out of a you know a population of maybe about 1500 students and I was the only Indian so there's not like a lo whole lot of uh, interaction with uh, other Indians only time I ever got that was when I would come down to uh, Jay Oklahoma and see my relatives and uh, hang out with them for the summer and things like that and yeah so you basically spent summers back in Down, Oklahoma yeah. each year mm -hmm. So they drop me off and they come down and see me. Then, about time to go to school, I'd go back up to Kansas City. So. Did you um, were you around the language quite a bit too? My uh, my folks spoke it fluently. Everybody, my all my relatives spoke it fluently. For some reason, I um, my tongue doesn't work that way. It doesn't make the noise, the guttural sounds that uh, everybody else does. So I understood what they were saying. I just couldn't speak it very well. And, when, and one bad thing is that they uh, kind of, they just look at me and shake their heads and, and for disapproval about how I, how I was saying things. So I just stopped. Oh. So I just, would just stop, you know, spoke to back in English. But they would, you know, it was always that uh, the flow of from English to Cherokee to Cherokee. In English, you know, all the time. There's that was going on constantly, right. and my aunts and uncles. Uh, that's all they spoke was Cherokee. So if you hung out with them, you had to speak some, you know, to get your point across. Right. Because they spoke very little English, and I spoke very little Cherokee. So at Bacon, did you continue with ceramics, or did you study other things? Um. That there, I was more of an academic. I, I, you know, I took biology, I took botany, English, history, things like that to get those basic requirements out of the way. So. Right. Were you aware of any um, art instructors there that were? Um, West Dick West was there at the time, and I'd go in just to see what they were doing. And a lot of my friends were uh, taking art courses, beading courses. Uh, things like that, drawing courses. Right. And I thought, well, if I go come back here next semester, I'll, I'll, I'll sign up for a class, but I didn't come back for that uh, spring semester. And that was when you were still on the lawyer track? Kind yeah, of, still, still going gotcha. into that. <laughs> um, so 
You eventually set up your own studio in Seligman, Missouri. Yes. Did you build it yourself? I, um, during the course of my uh, shows, I met and became friends with a guy who did uh, leather, contemporary leather. And we became real good friends and I would come down to his place, which is in Seligman, and uh, hang out and bring the family down. Well, it was just Shell and I at that time. And we'd uh, just hang out and do shows together. And I t asked him one, one fall, I said, uh, if you know of any place in the Seligman area or any land for sale, let me know. I'm kind of interested in buying some land and setting up a you know, household. And about three or four months later, he called me up. He says, how would you like to buy my place? So we worked out a deal. I bought his place and you know, it's in the middle of 40 acres. I still have the land. Wow. Uh, it had a studio already there. He had built a, a uh, leather studio where he did all his leather work. And it, would, it was kind of small, but it would work for me. So I built my, um, built my kills. I, um, we moved in, I built my kills, um, set up studio, and that was our home for about 13 years until I decided it was time to move on a little bit, you know, try out the other things. So when you built your kilns, were they um, similar to what you had used at Silver Dollar City? Or? Well, these Silver Dollar City ones were uh, store-bought. I see. And the, yeah. mine were freestanding. Yes. They were built, you know, and I had to lay bricks. So you had to be somewhat of a, of a mason to, you know, get everything level, right. build it up so it wouldn't fall over, things like that. What did you burn for? Ah, propane. Propane, okay. Propane, yeah. Cool. I was still <laughs> gas. propane. <laughs> yeah, I was still a gas potter. Um, so, once you set up your studio, you began doing more booth shows? Or mm -hmm. did you combine them with galleries at that point? Um, I, was, I started doing lots of shows all over the place. And I came across a woman you might know, uh, I know you know her, or knew her, uh, Jane Malden. Yes. And Jane asked me what I was doing, doing the shows I was doing. She says, Which were kind of straight arts and crafts. Crafts, right. Sort of yeah. stuff. And pretty contemporary. She says, you need to quit doing those and you, know, you need to start doing native shows. And it was her influence and her little pushing <laughs> that got me in to start doing uh, native shows. And um, haven't haven't regretted it. It's been great. Um, she became a great friend of mine. Um, I started doing Indian shows. Started being picked up by galleries. So um, I dealt with galleries pretty much all across the United States. And this is all I do is just uh, native shows. I used to do a whole bunch of them. You know, about 15, 16 a year. But now I'm down to about oh six or seven a year. And I still do with galleries, so right. it works out real good. So, is or what year are we talking about here, approximately? Uh, approximately, I'd say late, early, early eighties. Early eighties. Yeah. And there was a flourishing Indian art scene going on. Is is that when you started to do incorporate native designs? Well, I had started doing that before that, okay. before that, because um, I started um, uh, remembering dragonflies, um, a lot of uh, pottery from Japan in the Orient, and I noticed that occasionally you would see a dragonfly in there, which started me uh, thinking about uh, my grandfather, and uh, and I started um, just kind of. I wanted first to do them in a stamp form where I could just stamp them on, but I did. I wasn't getting. They wasn't. They wasn't doing anything for me. Yeah. So I started painting and learned, you know, how to paint them on the way uh, I do now, and it's developed. And that was the first native design I started using was uh, was a dragonfly, and then I started doing dancers, and then it just opened up to buffalo, deer. Uh, Indians riding horses, uh, turtles, um, 
frogs, jackrabbits, and occasional birds, things like that. So that's when that's when it's really kicked in was I, uh, I guess early early eighties. Um, and and it, besides being just a powerful symbol for a lot of tribal cultures, um, you have some strong associations with dragonflies because of your grandfather. Yes, um, having him tell me the story stories of his um, early uh, life. He was born in 1865 when um, Lincoln was, the year Lincoln was assassinated, my grandfather was born. And so to honor Lincoln, they named him Lincoln. So that's his name was Lincoln Trottingworth. And he told me all kinds of stories about, uh, you know, uh, late 1800s about living and having to ride on a horse to go anywhere or in a wagon to go anywhere or walking to go anywhere and uh, he talked about a date his his first wife on horseback so you know he just had all kinds of stories about um, running into people who ran into the uh, territory to get away from the law oh you know, you know, and I, you know. Just, he said, he said at one time I I met um, like Jesse James, things like that, because he ran away from the law and ran into the territory. So, you know, it was just he had all kinds of stories. It was uh, he worked for um, Charles Page over here as a stain ma a stone mason and helped build part of Tulsa, the original part of Tulsa, wow. being a stone mason. So he had all kinds of stories, and he was a. Uh, a funny man, and he uh, and around uh, after dinner at his house, uh, he would uh, have a a, a a clay pipe that he always smoked out of. He had one bowl of tobacco that he would smoke up a day, and it was after dinner, and it was in the winter time. It was a big wooden stove that he, you know, and he'd sit around and my folks and he would talk and he would, you know, he, he would tell little bit things about his life then too. It was pretty interesting. Were your markets um, stronger, do you think, or a little bit more active, your galleries in Oklahoma and your, and your shows in Oklahoma, or were they pretty much um, just depending on the show and the part of the country? My markets seem to be better outside of Oklahoma. I, I had a, a, a gallery I dealt with in uh, New York City, outside of New York City, and that was always a strong market. I would go there twice a year. I have a gallery I deal with uh, in Chicago. That's always been a, a real strong show for me. So I always seem to do better outside of Oklahoma. For, you know, I don't know if there, because there's so many Indians in Oklahoma or what, but I, I do better outside of Oklahoma. Um, the other, there's just a small, actually, relative proportionate to painters, anyway, small number of potters, um, but there are some interesting Cherokee potters uh, who work in very different styles. Have you? Um, Develop friendships with them, or spent much time uh, talking with them. Yeah, I know Bill Glass. I know um, Jane Osteen, and um, there's Pat. Pat, what was it Gill Gill Gillian? I can't remember, but she's a she was a a local Cherokee potter. Um, Anita Fields. Who's a, I consider a contemporary with me. Right. Um, the ones I've mentioned before, Jane and Bill, are kind of traditional in a way. And um, oh, I can't. Boy, her name just slipped my mind. She lives in Anna does. Yeah. Yeah, Anna Mitchell. Anna Mitchell. And um, after meeting her and talking to her for a while, um, she says, "Well, you know, we we are related." I said, are we really? She says, yes. <laughs> My maiden name was Six Killer, and I'm from Piney Creek area, which is the area that I was, I was born in. 
I said, so you were a six killer? She says, yeah, blah, blah, blah. So distant, distant cousins. Uh huh. That's we cool. are just, yeah, very, <laughs> very distant, you know, you know, but we are cousins. So. What was, uh, in, how many, what kinds of art competition, competition shows did you enter? Well, um, like Red Earth, you know, their competition, there's, there are usually competitions that have a market to go along with them. Um, Santa Fe market, Indian market, uh, the herd, um, the Idol Jorg, the uh, in the Tulsa Indian market, the Tulsa Indian Arts Festival, and the Tulsa Cherokee Art Market, and the Five Slice Tribes Market. They always have little competitions to go along with their with their retail shows. So and that's it's kind of works out pretty well for me that way. What uh, what's one award that was especially meaningful to you? Well, it's it's a small award, but um, I do the Five Civilized Tribes show and uh, Art Under the Oaks, and they have a competition there. And uh, I entered a piece. It's been several years ago, probably about five or six years ago, or longer. And um, I got the best of show. I mean, you know, getting best of show that's really nice, but. I found out that Ben Harjo was the judge, and getting a an award, you know, to me, and having Ben Harjo judge the show, that's that meant a lot to me because I respect Ben Harjo's work. I, mean, I enjoy it. I have several of his pieces, so I re really respect Ben because I think he uh, he's out there doing, you know, what. What works for him, he's a very talented artist, he's, uh, he works at it. I mean, it, people have an idea that uh, artists, you know, work when they just feel the urge, you know, <laughs> and you can't do that, you know, you've got to get in there and you've got to work. And I respect his uh, worth of ethics and uh, the, his work period, so, in a, in a, you know, a judge him to my work. I like that a lot. How about museum shows? Have you had many of those? I've had um, a few of them. Um, but there again, they always coincide with the markets, but uh, I'm having a museum show coming up in April of this year. And uh, it's going to be at the Southern Plains Indian Museum in Anadarko. And you will get a nice catalog. Yeah, <laughs> we'll get a nice catalog. <laughs> I mean, that's you know one of the very good perks about doing that show. But and and it's going to be a one man show. Wonderful. And uh, there's other shows. But, um, I did a show here in Tulsa for Living Arts, and it was the inaugural show for. They have a series of uh, the four elements, you know. Um, the earth, uh, wind, fire, and I was the only potter in that show of the four. And I was a star, one of the starters in that show. That's neat. So, uh, you've mentioned um, the ceramicist John Glick as an influence as well. When did you first see his pottery and how did it uh, influence you? Well, John Glick is a potter out of uh, Farmington, um, uh, Help me here, Farmington, outside of Detroit, Michigan. Michigan. Yeah, Farmington, Michigan. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you work quicker than me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, his use of color. I mean, he has he has a basic, you know, uh, basic pots, and then he goes back with glaze, and then he does glaze on glaze, and he does painting on glaze. He does all these things that thought well. That kicked into my brain. I thought, I don't have to strictly do uh, glaze on glaze and rely on that. I mean, you can get very nice effects that way, but it's not saying anything about me to the people. And so I, you know, I, there's not much to, I didn't study his work, but I like the possibilities that he showed me on his work. Right. 
Um, you're part owner of the Brady Artist Studio with Donna Prigmore, who's also a potter. Uh, when and how did you first meet Donna? Um, it's been uh, maybe 10 years ago, maybe more. I can't remember. Memory, one of those things that goes pretty quick. <laughs> but they had a show. Do you remember that uh, Gilcrease having a show of the uh, masters like uh, Moran, um, who's Hurley? Wilson Hurley. Wilson. They had a big show of his and Moran pieces of his. And it brought in a lot of attention to the Tulsa, Tulsa area. At that time, this was a very young uh, gallery and studio, and they wanted a, to do a show along with that, but be a native show. And um, they asked, uh, I think it was um, Anita Fields. They asked Anita Fields, who was in the area, you know, who, who were potters in the area who might want to do this show. And they, through them, through her, to them, they contacted me to do a show. And Anita Fields was in it, Jane Oste was in it, um, can't think of very many other people in it. Mike Daniels was in it, um, and a few other potters that were in the area were in the, invited into the show, and we did it. And I got to be friends with the owners, um, John Wissinger and uh, Donna and Lisa Kahn. And they were talking about how they would like to expand their studio. And I was about the end, about 12 years of living in Seligman, I decided that I was getting tired of watching trees grow because <laughs> my studio was way out in the country, out in the woods. No one ever came in. No one ever came by. It was I was pretty much by myself until the kids and my right. wife came home. Mm -hmm. So I was getting a little burnt out. So I contacted them and asked them if they would rent out studio space for me. And this little, you know, box up here, right. they rented that out to me. And I worked here for about, though, a year. And um, John and Lisa got an opportunity to go to Tampa Modern Museum to work. And they were no, wanted to know if I'd be interested in buying their half of the studio. And I came up with the money. And then Don and I have been partners for 12, 13 years. So I've been here for a while. And it's worked out great. And you, you um, offer classes here as well. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, we, teach, we teach anybody who wants to do uh, clay. It doesn't have to be on the wheel. They want to do slab work, we'll teach them how to do that. They want to do coil work, we'll teach them how to make do coils and do, do everything. Basically, we can teach you anything in, in, um, in clay. Um, I'm the person who teaches the, the wheel work, because that's my expertise. Donna teaches anything in slab built and coil built, because that's, that's her medium. So we have students, we've had, um, we've had one lady come who drives in from Pryor, Oklahoma, which is about, I'd say 50 miles away. Mm -hmm. She comes in about, she comes in once a week. She has for the last 10 years. Wow. And she has her own equipment, wheel and everything like that, but she still wants to come in and she says we give her inspiration and, and <laughs> teach her little nuances all, all the time. So. And I was thinking it's probably a good, uh, initially when the studio started out, I know, you know, downtown Tulsa wasn't, uh, it was actually in decline and it might have been a good way of supplementing your incomes. Was that part of the reason for that? No, I just wanted a place to work out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, it, it, it Donna was, was giving lessons, so you were committed to... Yeah, I was committed to, to doing see. lessons. Okay. And in actuality, the uh, students pay for, they, you know, they help pay on the rent and mm -hmm. pay for the utilities. So right. my out-of-pocket expenses for uh, having my own studio is it's pretty minimal. So, and that's basically it right there because without, <laughs> without them, it'd be kind of tough going sometimes. 
Have you gotten ideas from teaching? Is there yeah, there's been a few, few things like, why didn't I think of that, you know? And, you know, it's not like stealing, but the thought they've, they've, they've hit up on a, a note that, yes. that you can take and then, you know, you all, you're gone already off on that note. It's, you know, there's here still, but you're off over here on using that one note they hit up on. Um, in, uh, what kinds of changes then did you know to, in the kind of Indian art show scene uh, from 80 to 90, just specifically in terms of Oklahoma? Well, back in the 80s, it seems like um, the uh, art markets in Oklahoma were pretty strong. Uh, I, I had no problem about making a living and supporting my family doing shows and doing galleries in and around Oklahoma. They um, seem to be a lot strong and I guess it's like anything else, there's uh, ebb and flows, you know, it goes up, it goes down and um, for me, I guess I've built up a, uh, a little reputation my, that I can weather out the low parts pretty good, you know, they don't affect me too much. Seems like we're in a little low, low area right now, you know. <laughs> um, in 1990, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act was passed requiring artists to provide proof of enrollment or certification by their tribe. I'm wondering if you noticed how it impacted artists and galleries. And you weren't always in Oklahoma quite as much, but... Well, people started um, wanting to see that, that identification, that you were uh, who you say you were. And to be honest with you, I hadn't thought about it. I've always known who I was before. Uh, I've done, you know, you know, I just, you know, I never had, I had, I didn't think about it. It, it really didn't enter my mind about ha having to prove that I was uh, Cherokee. And then, but when that act came in, I had to go back and prove who I was. And it took me about three or four years to do it because, you know, there was times when I could not get the, uh, uh, you know, the like birth certificate, my mom, because the uh, certificate was in the courthouse in J and had burned down, so there went her birth certificate. So I had to go and do all this other paperwork to prove that she was born, and so therefore I was born, you know. It just, wow. it was just a big mess, and I didn't like it, and I uh, really didn't care too much for the, uh, for the law. And then there would be some would-be Indians who, you know, this much Indian in them, <laughs> but could prove it, and making a big issue out of it, out of into the shows, and and that just uh, really irritated, uh, really irritated me that they they did that. And at the time, there was some um, there was some artists. They're still they're still around that they can't prove their lineage, but I know that they're Indian, and and that I I think that knocked them a few of them out. But there again, it let those little bitty, you know, in Indians in. So, I just, you know, right. I just, I'll tell, I said, bug the crap out of me. It just really did. Um, I remember, uh, in fact, we're going to get to look at one of your um, house like sculptures. But I wanted to ask you, and this may not be the phrasing that you use, you know, functional pieces as opposed to aesthetic pieces, but um, I like to call them sculptures. Um, are they, Raku or are they ceramic? Well, these everything I do is um, is functional. Even my my uh, sculptural pieces are functional. Okay. And, you know, there's there's a little bit of function in there, but it so I can call them functional. For me, they have to have function. I uh, that Unitarian, you know, you got to do something with this piece has always been there for me. It's I've always stuck in my head that I've you've got. If you want to use this, you can use this. And these pieces I make, 
our um, cone tin stoneware, which means that the clay has the ability to go up to the temperature of 2,381 degrees without falling apart or anything like that. And that's real high on the heat scale. If you're looking into a fire, you know, a fireplace, something like that, and you see uh, little flashes of bright yellow, okay, that yellow means that that little spot for a split second is maybe 2,200 degrees. And that's, so if you go into the white hot, then you're getting up to the heat range for the pieces I fire at. And I do Raku pieces, which is pieces that I fire up to around 1800 degrees, which is five, 600 degrees lower than the, the, my other pieces I do. And those are considered low fire. But they're still functional. They're still functional if you don't mind leakage, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember uh, meeting uh, your dad, I think, at one of your early openings here, yeah. or some family members, mm -hmm. and I was just wondering, um, and they have been, of course, supportive of you throughout the years, uh, but that must have been an especially wonderful moment the first time they came to a show that you had in a studio that you co-owned. What was that like? Well, um, I have to say that when I first started out, my dad uh, for a real job was a pipe fitter. He was in the Pipe Fitters Union up in Kansas City. And if I wanted to be, I could have been a pipe fitter I because I, I worked on the job sites with him being his apprentice. And which, you know, made big money. And when I said that I wanted to be a potter, go down to Silver Dollar City and work, they just didn't quite understand that route because, let me see, you will give up good money here to make <laughs> minimum wage down there. So they weren't too happy, but when I went, when I was working at Silver Dollar City, they came down and, you know, I, I gave them, you know, passes and they came in and everything like that and uh, watched me demonstrate. And when it, there was kind of a lull in the demonstration, and uh, I heard my dad say, and nudge, nudge the guy next to him. He said, that's my son down there who's making that pot. And then I knew it was okay, you know? And then they, you know, he was, and after that, whatever, you know, I needed help on or something like that, they were there for me. And that was, and when they came to my first show, my, my one-man show here at this gallery, they, they were just tickled, tickled to death, you know. You thought, well, we, we know we got a son who actually did something, you know. <laughs> uh, In 2007, you were one of a, a number of Native artists who participated in a cultural exchange with African artists. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that experience a bit? This was through the Kellogg Foundation. In, in uh, uh, they worked with the uh, IAIA out of Santa Fe, and they wanted basically about 40, 45 artists in certain fields to go to South Africa to work in and around South Africa, some of the uh, some of the other countries like in Botswana, um, Zaire. I think it's Zaire, isn't it? Zambia, Zambia, uh, Mozambique, and I was part of a team who worked with potters. Now there was four, four other uh, potters and me. The other four potters worked in traditional pottery, and I was the only contemporary potter out of the, out of the group. Uh, the selection committee, I don't know how they did that, but I got picked, so I went. We worked in a little Zulu um, um, village, and we gave a workshop to the Zulu uh, potters. And it should have been more like they gave us a workshop because they were so talented and were so sure about what they were doing. 
all we could offer them was um, maybe a few new ideas they hadn't thought about and uh, maybe try to think of different ways for them to market their their wares because that's they that's what part of our uh, goal was to give, incorporate new ideas to them to work and to uh, help them market their uh, there was a better way for them to market their pieces because if a uh, Zulu potter made a pot and she sold it for, let's say, $20 at her studio, okay, by the time it got to the gallery in um, Dur uh, uh, Dur um, Durban, um, it would uh, it'd be about $120. But she would still only get twenty dollars. So you know, it was you know, we're trying to figure out different ways for them to market it. Mm -hmm. And we came up with um, new designs as far as uh, making masks. You know, I've been I was involved with the the gallery here, and we started selling African pieces. So we I, I looked at African masks, and so when we went down there we came up with, how about making clay African masks? And it was just like, it was like, it was kind of like a real inspirational moment because all of a sudden this light goes above their, all our heads. You know, man, we can make masks. And they had a ball with it. They made all kinds of masks. They, uh, you know, had not ne necessarily represented their, their uh, tribe because every tribe has different masks just a free spirit of making masks, you know, in the way they wanted to. And they make some really very nice masks. So if you see any clay masks coming out of Africa now, that's cause, partly because of our influence. And rattles, they had never thought about rattles. And, I, and that one was one, my idea, because I started making rattles and showed them how to make rattles and they started making rattles after that. So it was just kind of a, uh, just more of an inspiration for them because when it came to uh, uh, their ability to work in clay, oh man, they were, they, they just blow us away. You know, things we would make, take us a week, they would do in a day. Things they would fire up, you know, we'd wait two weeks to fire their, our pieces up, they were firing it up the next day, you know. The, Things they, the little shortcuts they would do, and, and the tools. Uh, we would, you know, you here we'd go to a store, a clay store, clay uh, manufacturer, and, and we'd buy little rubber ribs, uh, wooden tools, little knives. And what they would use was uh, broken down, broken butter knives, um, Purex bottles that, you know, the plastic, yes. they would cut those out and that would be their ribs. Wow. I mean, their tools of plastic, little bits of plastic they would use to help shine the, the clay up. I mean, they were, it was a very, I don't know, I don't want to say archaic, but their, 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 the, their methods were very austere yeah. because they didn't have very much to work with. The tribe, the, the, uh, village we were at had no running water, had no uh, electricity, nothing like that. Uh, so we had to bring in our own bottled water to drink, things like that. And uh, lunch was always a, an experience because they, they felt they, they, would, they did their best to feed us. And so when it was lunchtime, we'd go down and it was kind of like a little buffet style, you know. Give me some of that, 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 and that. And uh, one time, I, I, uh, I saw something that looked like mushrooms. You know, like the underside of mushrooms, the veins. You know? Right. So I said, "Yeah, give me some of that." And uh, the cooks looked at each other and looked at me. You want some of that? And, you know, they pointed down. They didn't speak <laughs> English, and I didn't speak Swahili. So, yeah, that. Check my head. Okay. And they gave me some of that, take it back to my uh, table, and I'm eating on it. And 
eating on it and I'm chewing on it. <laughs> chewing on it. <laughs> and I, there's an interpreter sitting there eating lunch with me. And I ask her, so um, what is this? And she looks at me, she smiles, she says, oh, stomach of a chicken. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so that, real, real chewy. <laughs> but we um, ate, we had, we had crocodile, we had ostrich, we had all kinds of things. It was, it was quite an experience. And I realized I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to live or stay in a third world country very long. I'm too spoiled, far, far too spoiled by all the conveniences we have, we don't, that we take for granted. Mm. It's just amazing what people, how people live. And I, yeah, I thought, oh, there's got to be a better way. Have you um, traveled out of the country any other place besides Africa? Oh, Canada, Mexico, that's about it. With your artwork or? Uh, no, because of it. I mean, yeah, that's what. Yeah, well, because I went to a show and okay. that I made money, so now I can go. Up, I can <laughs> okay. go up to Canada, you know. Okay. <laughs> um, you have a, a number of high-profile shows, including Santa Fe Indian Market. Um, do you remember your first show in Santa Fe? Yeah, I do. It was, yeah, I was, um, I was sharing a booth with uh, Gina Gray. Uh, Gina Gray talked to me and said, well, get into the, in the market and we can share a booth. And so out of a five by ten foot, those small booths. Yes. <laughs> I had this much space, about this much space and about that much length to display what I wanted to sell. Because being a painter, she needed all <laughs> the wall space <laughs> everywhere else. So uh, I, I still made money. It wasn't much, but you know, paid for, my, paid for my booth, paid for everything, my expenses and everything, and still came out with a few hundred bucks after that. But that was my wow. first, uh, <laughs> first show, and I was really, um, amazed at watching what goes on and how that show's run, how early people come there. I mean, early. <laughs> yes, before the sun. <laughs> sun comes up, that they're out there with their flashlights, so, you know. So, did you try to get your own booth then the following year? Or you yeah, that after that, I, I was, my main goal was to uh, <laughs> get my own booth. And I eventually moved into a, my own 5 by 10 and then they moved me into a 10 by 10 with sharing with someone else. And I would, I felt real bad for anybody who shared with me because I would overwhelm that person because the people would come in and I'd have people standing in line right. to sell stuff. And this poor person, they didn't get a chance to see, no one got a chance to see their work because all these people standing in my booth. That sounds real boisterous, but that's the way it was. No, it often works out that way when you've got two artists. Yeah. Notice one first. And you have a lot of repeat collectors, especially for your, um, like, earth and your stoneware. Do you think you get to know your collectors in a deeper way, maybe, than a painter or sculptor who might just make a couple of sales to one individual? Or? Well, I think um, all artists, um, especially as you're starting out, People, uh, I don't know if they recognize talent or they like, well, like what you do. So I've had people who have been buying from me from when, you know, let's say I sold a cup for $12 and now I sell my cups for 25, but they've still have been coming up with me. And as they, as I go up in price and, and everything, They've come up with me, and they've come up and bought bigger pieces. Yeah, uh, you know, where as let's say a bowl, I would sell my bowls for twenty dollars, and now my price range for my bowls is like eighty dollars, going up to about four or five hundred dollars. And these people now are buying the bowls for four or five hundred dollars. You know, so I uh, and and you get to know them. Um, I'm real bad with names, you know. 
I'm real bad with names, but I use the uh, adage that, oh, I know you, so I must be in <laughs> Chicago, you know? And I know them, and I know, like, well, I know they got a dog, or, you know, things, little things that you pick up uh, from talking to them over the uh, years. So, well, how's your son doing? How's he doing? How's, is he still in college? You know, little things, and that, you know, you start talking, you build a rapport with them, and they know my family, they know my two kids. Well, how's your daughter? You know, is she married now and all this kind of stuff? Your, your son's still in college. So, yeah, you build up a rapport, and and because of that, you build up a friendship, and uh, and it's what the nice thing about it is they, they come along with you. Yes. For this 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 journey, I mean, whatever of my hit my career, which is kind of kind of strange in a way because I never thought about it as a career until about ten years ago. I thought, this is my career. <laughs> this is what I'm doing. You order your clay um, commercially. Have you ever dug your own clay, or are you interested at all in that? I've done that once. <laughs> <laughs> I had done that once and uh, realized that oh man this is this is way too much work and uh, and appreciate what the um, traditional potters who who do that you know there's a lot of traditional potters who will go out and dig their own clay and I appreciate that and realize why their pieces command such high prices because they're so labor intensive that uh, wow and I'm, I'm, I'm lazy. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> dinner, dinnerware is kind of your bread and butter still. Uh, what are the pluses and drawbacks of that? Um, for the pluses is I, um, they're pretty much no brainers. Like I, I just, I just make them, you know, and I use my designs and, uh, each one of them is still an individual piece, but it, um, it it's, doesn't take very much, requires very much thought. Whereas these, my sculptural pieces, you know, I think about them and then I put them back in back of my head and let them percolate or whatever, and then they'll come out back out. And this is the way I want to make them. So that, yeah, that requires a lot more. Um, uh, thought process and the uh, the dinnerware sets and the functional pieces I enjoy making them because I like I, I enjoy uh, I like I enjoy the whole process of throwing the piece taking it through the whole process and and hopefully coming out like I want want them to in the beginning that wasn't I wasn't so sure but now I'm to the point now where I know what they're going to look like, and the majority of the time I already see them in my head. But okay, this one's going to have this design on, and this is how it will look. So. And you don't lose many in the firing process. No, not it. Not. I might lose one piece out of, um, let's say, three, four firings, and and I can put in. Uh, I don't know. I've never counted the number of pieces I put into a firing. My kill is about. Uh, 24 cubic foot on the inside, so it's a pretty good size, uh, and that's the stacking area. So uh, maybe one out of two or three hundred, something like that. Electric kiln, right? No, gas. Oh, gas, okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mentioned that um, wonderful quality of movement that really comes with all your designs. You have these little figures also wearing the headdresses, and. You know, everything seems to kind of move. So it takes good drafting skills. It's not like doing geometric designs, you know what I mean? Yeah, and without knowing it, when I was in high school, I started out in um, eighth grade or seventh grade, I can't remember, uh, taking drafting classes. And I had no idea why, it just, I did it. And so you, you develop a, a, a sense of spatial relations, you know, how as you're moving away for something, things should be, you know, moving. And, and that, that has been 
in, ingrained or whatever, but just because of those drafting classes, I can go back and say, oh yeah, this is the way it should look as it trails back or something like that. The movement, I think, comes from, from that technical drawing. I, I never thought of, you know, I never thought about it as a, you know, when I was taking it, that I could use it later on, but everything you learn, I think, helps out. You know, every, it doesn't matter. I, you, I can go to painting uh, workshops and pick up something out of that painting workshop that will help me in my, in my work now. Do you do that occasionally? Yeah, I do. Your yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I've gone to uh, painting workshops at TU, you know, watched other people and other mediums uh, work. I've gone to the glass blowing shop uh, two doors down and I blew glass for, you know, a little bit, just nothing, nothing big, but the under, you know, understood the qualities of the glass and how it works and things like that and picked up uh, dimensions, how I want to incorporate some dimensional things in my, uh, in my uh, work now that I'm trying to work out now. Just okay. ideals you might see within a year or two. That sounds interesting. Um, you've sort of had some trademark color schemes which were like blue and black or brown and then mm -hmm. a green and a brown I think you often paired it with. Can you talk a little bit about the um, design process and uh, your slips? And well, um, I fire up the code 10, like I said, and when you fire up to that temperature, you're starting to limit the number of colors you can work with. I can work with green, I can work with brown, I can work with blue underneath the glazes. Now these are strictly underneath the glazes. Now anything else is going to burn out. I can't work with yellows. Yellows won't show up, or reds. Reds won't show up because I, they'll burn out. But these three colors I can work with, and you have to think about your designs in those three colors. Uh, I mean, as but as far as glazes. I can I can do purples, I can do uh, yellows, I can do reds. I just choose not to, you know, because, <laughs> uh, you know, purple, I don't know, you know, or pink, I don't know, you know, so I can use those kind of glazes. Red, have you used yeah, the red glazes? Red, I use red I glazes I as, as um, oh, accent, accent pieces, accent glazes, but, uh, but uh, purple and pink and you know things like that just <laughs> don't fit in my palette you know and you're sort of not using so much green anymore because well green is a um i use a green and i mix my own glazes i'll explain why i don't use the green so much is i mix my own glazes and uh, all the elements i use come out of the ground so they mine them okay so as you go through a vein of, um, let's say, copper, you know the copper has got a certain, and it's get, you know it's got a certain um, molecular uh, composition of it, okay. But it doesn't stay true with all the copper that's mined. You know there's some little nuances always in the different. Uh, different areas of that vein. Even in that vein of two feet, there'll be little dip and differences in it. So, uh, with, and that's true with all the elements that I use. Oh, the, the flint, I use flint. And um, marble, which is calcium carbonate. Uh, there's always a little variances. And over the course of the years, a certain kind of, uh, mineral uh, will change because it's, it's uh, composition of it is changed a little bit. And so you gotta, you gotta incorporate that and you gotta figure out different things, how to counteract that. So um, the greens, the copper um, has changed since the first time I used it. So now I have to make adjustments on it till I get to the point where I'm happy with it again 
and I'll start using it more, <laughs> but it, it's always adjustments. There's always adjustments to make. Mm -hmm. So you got to be somewhat of a chemist to uh, to work with it because you're, you know, that periodic uh, table you see up on, you know, chemistry places, chemistry right. boards. <laughs> Well, I, I have to deal with that. It's no fun. What's your creative uh, process from the time you get an idea? Creative process. Um, let's say um, I, on my shows, uh, I go to um, a lot of times when I'm at the Southwest, I will go to places like um, Chaco Canyon, um, the Four Corners area, and look at, uh, let's say, petroglyphs. And I've been up in Missouri looking at petroglyphs. I've been in Arkansas looking at petroglyphs. And seeing those designs, and um, sometimes I draw them down, sometimes I just keep them in my head. but. And I will borrow from those, not verbatim, you know, not the same design, but I will uh, loosely use those designs. And then I will draw them out, and then I'll do uh, little, when you, when you make something mocks, mock-ups of that, see how it works, see how, the, see how it works with the color palette that I use and uh, try it that way and there's you know there's several designs a lot of designs and I thought, ah, this isn't going to work for me and then i had to feel it you know i thought oh this i like this it you know it feels good for me i can use this so um but there is some designs that i tried and i thought no that isn't that is not going to work for me so do you keep sometimes the designs just hanging on the wall there as you're trying them out? Or, or little stri strips of paper, you know? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that design, I like that one. <laughs> you know, things like that, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, but a lot of times they're on the walls and, um, and sometimes um, when I do sculptural pieces, um, I make baskets, I like to make baskets, loosely called baskets i'll put it that way are they clay they're clay oh, they're, yeah okay. they're clay but anything that has a handle it has an opening i'll call a basket okay so, okay you know so i've made baskets and um when i've gone to phoenix and have come back the southern route there is a range of mountains called the chocolate mountains and um just you know i like that layer of uh you know, mountains where one layer is in front of a layer, in front of a layer, you know, you see that. And I've incorporated that into handles for these baskets that I make. So, you know, just about anything I look at, you know, I don't realize it, but I, you store it back. You know, you put it back and, and when you don't, uh, you don't think about it and it'll pop up. And that's how I do a lot of my, uh, more creative work is I will, I want to make, I want to make a man, I want to make a figure. And uh, I will, you know, think about it, of course, think about it in front, you know, for lack of a better term, I'll think about it in my front part of my brain and then send it back and let it percolate and then let it come back up to the front again and think, oh, this is, this, this will work. And then I, then I can visualize it, I can, turn it around three-dimensionally and said, yeah, that will work. In my mind, I'll turn it around three-dimensionally and say, this is what I want to make. And then make that piece, but it's not going to be exactly you know, what I see, but it's going to be very close to what I see in my mind. So. Mm -hmm. um, what is your creative routine, like your general, how many hours a day, you, what's the routine? Now, when I'm, I come into the studio, I try to come in here in the mornings. Um, I'm usually here by nine. And um, I, there's always some things that you have to do. Computer work, check on things that, like the kill that you fired up the night before, electric one or the gas one, check on things. Um, 
go up onto the computer, see if there's anything I need to look at, messages and things like that. Just kind of slowly start working into the process. And as I'm doing these other uh, tasks, I um, start thinking about, okay, I need to make, you know, if I'm making pie plates, okay, you need to make pie plates. Make, make, you know, and I set it in my mind, you need to make 10 pie plates today. So go down there and get my hands on the clay. You know, start working up the clay. Start feeling of the clay. I weigh out the clay, I work the clay up. Um, then I set it aside and take, take a break. I'm real big at taking breaks. And, uh, <laughs> go do something else for a while, then I'll come back down and get ready. And I'll set it to wheel and I'll do what I need to do and get it done. And then take another break, you know, or in between, take another break. Right. So there's lots of breaks. You know. You're problem solving. On your breaks. Yeah, that's it. You know, Think about something else related to the to the clay. Yeah. Um, you know, I know for a while it, it may still be kind of a, it's always a balancing act to have enough inventory for yourself for a show, but at the same time supply the galleries that sell your work. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll put it this way. The galleries were probably, they're probably, they probably would like to see me more often than I, they, than I, than I choose to see them. Um, I, when they have a show for me, I will work for that show for them. And how it has been uh, for the last number of years is I don't consign I don't consign any pieces. I'll do a show for you, and uh, I'll give you the option to buy whatever you want to at, after uh, that show. And uh, nine times out of ten, I will do a show, and whatever's left, they just buy it outright because they know they're not going to see it for a while. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know that that keeps them kind of happy. But uh, I used to be able to take. Um, like January off, or I used to take be able, it will take July off and just you know do family things or uh, think about working. You know, a lot of times it's there's a lot of thinking about working because you uh, you can do it physically, yeah, but there's times you need to think about working and what you want to get done, what you would like to get accomplished. So you, you know, you gotta, I don't know, maybe other artists do this, I don't know. I'm, I, I think they do, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I have to think about working. And then I'll get in here and you'll go through those spurts where you're just gung-ho and you're working, you know, and that feels good. So. Have you ever um, sought out any casino commissions? <laughs> no, I haven't. There have been several no. plotters, actually. Yeah. There, um, there is the uh, Cherokee Casino out of here, the Hard Rock one, and there is uh, a bunch of, uh, not a bunch, but uh, a group of artists who seek them out and want them to buy their their work. I'm not one of them. Um, if they want to buy something, great, but I'm not going to go and and seek them out to, you know, get them to buy. You know, they seem to be doing okay without me and I seem to be doing okay <laughs> without them, so, you know. I mean, I guess it'd be nice for the notoriety, but that's okay. I'm not, you know, I'm not worried about that. So looking back on your career, um, in terms of any sort of real pivotal moments, uh, what do you see? Um, I think it, it's, it's been meeting people. Um, oh, and I will, um, and I'm, I've said this all uh, for a very long time, was meeting Jane Malden. Who is a Choctaw painter. Yes, and she was a very uh, personal person. I mean, you easy to talk to, very intelligent, I thought, and... Uh, she was the one who really got me going in, in the direction I have taken. 
and and she was a, a very big inspiration because uh, she would. Uh, I like this, you know. She, I would be, I would do things, and she said, "This looks good." I'm not too crazy about that, you know. <laughs> but this looks good, you know. So she was uh, critical a little bit, you know, not over critical, but she she would express her opinions, and that said a lot. That's always said a lot to me. Now, because there again, I respected her work. I got a lot of her pieces, and meeting other people um, have always been, and that's they're always in my life. Uh, you know, like um, meeting uh, Jane's sister, uh, Val Jean Hesse. Uh, there again, it was, she was always very supportive. And, uh, and basically, they were my first two contacts in the, the field I'm in now. Um, running into Ben, and I'll, I'll bring up Ben one more time, Ben Harjo. And I met him at a gallery. Um, Linda Griever, Linda Griever, I, had, I was selling uh, pots to Linda because Jay told me to go see Linda. And uh, Ben was hanging out there and uh, Ben came out to my car and was looking at my pots and Linda had gone back in and he says, well why don't you do traditional pots? I said, because I'm not a traditional potter. So, but, you know, little things like that. He probably didn't, never remembered that. But for me, it, you know, I thought, okay, well, I'm not a traditional pot. I'm a contemporary potter. This is what I do. And he said, well, you do a real good job what you do, but why don't you do traditional pots? I said, like, this is it, Ben, you know. Just, it's just always meeting people. Um, he and never, they sort of confirm or, the path that you're on or they make right. it clear for you. Make it clear, you know, they sometimes not knowing it, they do they do show you this is a, a way to go, you know. What has been one of the um, low what has been one of the low points in your career? When I burnt my kill shed down. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> Well, I think I know. Yeah, yeah. Do, <laughs> oh, I'm just doing a high fire, and um, in it, it, it taught me a couple of lessons. But it was a lesson that um, don't work till you're just exhausted. It was a, one big a lesson. And was I, it uh, insulating? No, it was actually uh, when we first got married. We lived in this little town called Nevada, and. Uh, I had built a studio, well, uh, I had built a kill in this old, very old, old, let me stress that, old <laughs> uh, garage. And it was, the wood was, uh, oh gosh, the wood was uh, dry rot. It was just, it was just barely standing. And um, I'd worked all through the night and I was doing a high fire, getting ready for a show. And something went wrong with the kill caught the roof on fire and I'm sitting there watching TV and I'm looking out the window and I see the smoke start coming up <laughs> my window so I jump up and run out there and I'm and I'm seeing my whole kill shed just burn down and the fire department is coming it's a big hoopla and uh, and that was a very low point for me because uh, my kill was ruined uh, that that load I lost, and the, the, the shed was down. I mean, it was just a, a miserable point. How about one of the high points? High points were, um, not just getting into the Indian market and having a booth of my own, a big booth of my own, <laughs> was, a, was a high point because I knew, I thought, well, if I can keep this, you know, I'm, I'm I'm there, or whatever you want to call it, um, and being asked to go to uh, gallery openings or you know have my own show, at, have a one-man shows at these galleries, has always been a high point. Um, and being treated, for lack of a better term, like a rock star, you know, 
having people lined up waiting for you to buy your work outside, you know. There's, you know, 10 people out standing outside waiting to come in and buy your work, you know. So that's, that's like, always. I've seen that outside your booth. <laughs> yeah. So it's, and, you know, it's always a high point, you know, and like yearly. It's hap uh, like, all right, this is happening again and it's still happening. I like that. You know? So um, I'm kind of thinking about what Bill Glass said about how nice it is to have Cherokee families of artists who sort of continue, you know, that art tradition within mm -hmm. the family, and it's certainly been coming down through your family, and um, I think while your children aren't necessarily engaged in the arts right now, I've seen them with you at shows, um, along with your wife. What, what, um, how, how has that impacted your art, I guess, to have, and what kinds of things have they helped with? My kids have come to the shows with me, my wife also, and just their support, you know. Their support as far as, you know, they just, you know, they get a big kick out of uh, going to my, my shows and uh, people talking to them about me, you know, and them, and my kids and my wife talking to them about me, you know, and they think that's a, a pretty big deal. And uh, to some of my shows, my, like there's one show, the Idol George show, the Indian Market, where my daughter just would go with me on a regular basis. And so and there again, we talked about um, people bring, big, uh, starting friendships and things like that. And so they'll be asking, well, where's Morgan, you know? Because they're so used to, you know, having Morgan there and dealing with Morgan because they know Morgan can talk the talk about my, you know, my pots and things like that. So, and Lincoln, Lincoln will go to, has gone to several shows with me and, you know, people start looking for him and asking him questions. Well, aren't you wanting to get into this, you know? <laughs> And um, and they have their own paths to go, you know. I'm not uh, I'm not gonna, you know, try to get them to go the way I went. My parents didn't try, you know, to get make me go the way they wanted me to go. So it's it's strictly up to them. Man. But, but Lincoln, there for a while, used to make some pieces, little pieces of buffalo that would hang up on the wall. And uh, he saw how easy it was to make these little pieces. And, you know, he didn't do anything. All he did was made them, and I took care of them for him. You know, fired them and everything like that. Did you ever take anything he shows? Oh yeah, and he sold at shows. You know, <laughs> you know there had, and I had people wanting to. Well, does your son still making those buffaloes? And I says, no, he stopped. So <laughs> he's in college now, and he's not doing those anymore. <laughs> oh, I was one to add to my collection, you know, so, but my, you know, I've, I've talked to uh, Lincoln about it, especially, because he has shown more interest in the artistic part of the world, whereas Morgan's pretty academic, and um, he has, we've talked about, you know, if you wanted to be something in the art world, you know, I've, I've started a path, and you could just step into that path and go, you know. My name is not a big name, Corn Checker, but you know, I said it's still people, there's some people who know it and recognize it, so, you know, you could go that way. But he is more artistically inclined the music way, you know, he, he likes music. And it amazes me to watch him um, play drums. I mean, to be able to do something with the right foot, do something with the left foot, and beat on the drum sticks at the same time, that is totally beyond <laughs> me, you know, and it's, I could never do that, you know. So he, you know, he's got his own path and so does Morgan, and uh, maybe grandkids. Yes, I, I'm willing to bet there will be another corn checker here, we said. So, yeah, <laughs> maybe grandkids. Um, well, is there anything you'd like to add or anything we forgot to cover? 
No, I think I, I honestly think we care, covered covered a lot, and um, I thought I, I probably talked too way too much, but uh, uh, you know I think I I said what I wanted to say. So. Right. Well, let's take a look at some of your work. Okay. Would you like to tell us about this sculpture? This sculpture is uh, number two in a series of uh, boarding school. Uh, places that the you know the uh, government sent students to 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 assimilate into uh, modern society. Uh, this one's called uh, Journey Cake Hall, which is a school down in or a building down in um, Bake Home College. And what it bothered me about when I was in Bake Home was that there was a school. Or the, the, the building with Journey Cake Hall, and behind Journey Cake Hall is a cemetery. And the students who were sent there in the early 1900s, 1914, 1915, 1916, and about that time there was a flu ep 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 epidemic. And instead of sending the bodies home, they buried them there behind Journey Cake Hall. And that's what this represents. It, uh, there's an open door. Right. And I don't know if you can see. Yeah, you there, can see the tombstones. But you can see the tombstones in the back, back behind the building. Mm. And when I was there in 1970, there was a, a mm -hmm. lot of tombstones. And then I went back about, oh, I'd say about five years ago, they had moved, took a lot of the, the, the bodies or what was left of the dirt, and moved them back to where they come from, to Arizona. Oh, they, they were repatriated. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. I thought, I, and that's what this represents. Mm -hmm. I did one on um, Carlisle Dreams, and it was another building similar to this, but it had a picture window, a big picture window in the middle of the building that I had done little uh, creatures with round humps on their backs and they uh, were carrying back the dreams of the students that were going to Carlisle uh, school at that time taking dreams back home mm -hmm. so that one was called Carlisle dreams and then there was another one Shalako because my mom had built had gone to Shalako as a as a teenager and gone to school and didn't care too much or the treatment, so that was pretty, pretty sparse. Just a very plain building because if you ever been to Chilaco, there's nothing out mm. in Chilaco, and that's now all I wanted to represent was just the starkness of Chilaco. And that's the little series I've done. I, I keep on thinking I'm going to do a few more, but uh, the inspiration hasn't hit me. This is a box. This is the lid, so wow. it, it does have functionality to it. It's not strictly a funk, uh, a you sculptural can store piece. Store things is, in there. You could put things in there if you wanted to. So yeah, it holds air real good. Cool. <laughs> this I call "Garden the Old Ways," and um, this is mostly a, a plain setting. Um, I watched a special on. Um, George Custard and the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And I was watching that and I was listening to, I think it was Colonel Remo or, I can't think of his last name. Yeah, that might have been Reno. Reno, yeah, that's it, Reno. And he mentioned that coming up onto the uh, campsite that the teepees were like uh, blades of grass in the prairie. And the bottom of this, these little um, spiky things yeah. represent teepees. Mm. For me, they represent teepees. And they are guarding the old way of, of hunting of the buffalo hunt. So that's what this piece for, you know, represents to me. And also, there again, the functionality is you could actually use this as a picture right. if you wanted to. You know, right. it's, a, it's a big beat picture. So. And you can see the, the movement of the yeah. buffalo there. So. Neat. 
that's that piece. And this piece um, reminds me of uh, going cane pole fishing with my uh, my grandfather. You know the the brown just representing the mother earth, dragonflies in and around the water, and you know it, it sounds kind of far off, but the, these little straps, which are just remind me of uh, of talking or getting back to my grandfather, just. Uh, Way he loved us, and he'd always, you know, whenever he saw us, he'd always just hug us, and that's just kind of like, you know, just wrapping himself around. Us. And basically, that's all that piece is. It's just something that reminds me of my grandfather. That's just wonderful. The dimensionality of it and the the contrasting shapes too. And he was always open. And he was always whatever we were doing, he would back us up. He was great about that. Well, Mel, thank you so much for talking with me today. Sure, my pleasure.